Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to the Edge Church Online. My name is Ryan Van Camp, and I'm the production director here. And we are so excited that you've chosen to spend your Sunday morning with us as we continue on in our sermon series, Christ in You. Now, before we jump into today's message and worship, we want to share a couple announcements with you about what's going on here at the Edge Church. The first thing we want to make sure everyone is aware of is that we are having a members meeting on Wednesday evening this week. It should take place from 8 to 8.45, um, and that's a members meeting that will be taking place on Zoom. This is an opportunity to hear from our elders and church leaders about uh, what's going on here at The Edge and what is in store for us here at The Edge. Then next Sunday is our uh, annual picnic at Wheatland Park in Aurora. That'll start at 945. We'll have a time of worship. We'll have a message followed by just uh, a time uh, of fellowship where we share a meal together. Um, So make sure you go ahead if you're coming to that, bring a dish to pass uh, and we'll have lots of fun and games for the kids too. And remember next week, since we are live at Wheatland's, this message will not be streamed. So you'll have to be there in person uh, to see what uh, our pastors have in store for us. Something else I really want to make sure um, you guys know is that this is our last week broadcasting on Facebook Live. We've talked about this transition uh, for a couple weeks now, but this is our last week that we'll be broadcasting on Facebook Live. Starting with our next service, we will only be on YouTube. So it would be great if you make sure that you, uh, you like, subscribe, and enable alerts on Uh, YouTube so that you can be aware of every message, every service, every worship song that gets posted there. So make sure that uh, when you come back next time, you're not looking for our services on Facebook, but you really look at our YouTube channel for that. All right, let's take a time uh, just to quiet our hearts and prepare us uh, for everything that God has for us today. Hey, welcome Edge Church to worship this morning. We are going to uh, start off worshiping God. And before we do, um, I just wanted to pray for us. I had something on my heart uh, this morning about um, hunger and just feeling like, um, I don't know, I'm at a place right now where I'm just, I'm asking God, make me hungry again. Make me hungry again. So, Maybe you're there, maybe you're not, but it's a good prayer and it's a good thought. And so I'm just going to pray for us before we start. So dear Lord, would you make me hungry again? Would you, would you give me a hunger that wells up inside me? Would you, would you make me like Zacchaeus who, who climbs a sycamore tree just to get a glimpse of you, Lord, just to get a glimpse of you because he didn't want to miss out on what you had for him. God, I don't want to miss out on what you have for me. I don't want to miss out. I don't want to let life get in the way of you, the source of life, God. And so would you make me hungry again? Make me hungry for the amazing, amazing things that you have in store for me, for those around me, for my family. Yeah. So let's worship you, God, because you're worthy. Amen. (laughs) When all I see is a battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am saved. So when I fight, I fight on my knees, my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle 
open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. your heart and lead me in your love to know 
from the ashes your love has brought us out of the darkness and into the light lifting our sorrows bearing our burdens healing our hearts to our God lift up one voice to our God lift up song to our God, lift up one voice, singing hallelujah to our God, lift up one voice to our God, lift up one song to our God, lift up one voice, singing Chains have been broken, eyes have been opened, an army of travel starting to rise. Death is defeated, we are victorious, you are alive. To our God, lift up one voice, to our God. Lift up one song to our God, we lift up one voice, singing hallelujah to our God. Lift up one voice to our God, we lift up one song to our God. We lift up one voice, singing hallelujah. Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday to you. Welcome to the Edge Church. My name is Stephen Van Den, and I'm one of the pastors here. I'm really grateful that you decided to join with us today as we come near to the end of our sermon series through the book of Colossians that we're calling Christ in You. And we've we've given it this title um, really because this series and the book of Colossians are all about Jesus and his gospel work in and through our lives, transforming us and changing us and making us more like 
him. And so uh, this morning, we're going to open up God's word together. We're going to see what God has to teach us by his spirit through the Apostle Paul and his letter to the church. Um, I'm going to pray for us if you'd pray with me. Father, come before you today uh, in the name of your son, Jesus. God, thanks for this moment and this time. God, thanks for your presence. God, thank you for your word. And Lord, as we open up your word today, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us. These scriptures were breathed out by you, Holy Spirit. They've been preserved by you and and they're best taught by you. And so I I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would teach us today. Give us ears to hear. uh, Give us hearts that are open. God, help us to receive all that you have for us today. God, I pray just against any distractions. God, I pray against uh, anything that would would turn our attention away from you today. Lord, help the eyes of our hearts, God, and our ears to be attuned to you. And we just commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, open it up to Colossians chapter 4. Congratulations, church. We've made it to the final uh, chapter together. And if you remember throughout Colossians, the Apostle Paul has been leading us through this progression from uh, a Christ-centered doctrine to Christ-centered practice, from helping us to, to know and understand uh, who God is and what Jesus has done for us, to, to how we are now to be and to live in response to Christ and the gospel. Uh, There is to be this uh, evidence of God's spirit alive in us, changing us, growing us, and maturing us. And this is what Paul has been talking about. If you remember in the beginning of Colossians chapter 3, he says that that since we have been raised with Christ, he says that, that we now put off our old self, that these are those things that are not of God's spirit, those beliefs and attitudes and and practices. He actually says to put those earthly sinful things to death, which means uh, as followers of Jesus, then we're to take sin seriously and and, and not passively, right? We're we're, we're to put it to death, not entertain it or or act like it's no big deal. Rather, we fight against sin and, and those things that stir our affections and obedience away from Jesus. And, and Paul then says that we're to put on this new self, right? This new identity in Jesus with new beliefs and attitudes and practices that are of his spirit and his nature and his character. And, and so Paul's been teaching us about what this looks like in our lives and in our relationship, but he's not quite then done yet. Paul still has a few final things to teach the church specifically about prayer and our witness to the world. And so we're, we're going to look at this starting in chapter 4, verse 2. Here's what Paul says to us. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Now, this is pretty straightforward here, right? Paul, Paul's saying, listen, church, one of the essentials of your faith in Christ, one of the marks of your maturity is that you are people of prayer. Now, now firstly, the question would be, well, what is prayer? right? Uh, and pretty simply, prayer is just talking and listening to God. It's a conversation. It's it's communication. It's a relationship because that's really what Christianity is. Primarily, Christianity is not a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's not religious duties. It's primarily a relationship with your Father in heaven. And so so prayer then is not some button that we push, but but is rather a relationship we pursue. And all good and serious relationships involve communication, don't they? I mean, that's we know this to be true, and that's what prayer is. And, and you can pray to God and talk to him in, in all kinds of ways. It's not about how loud or how quiet you are. It's not about how long or short the conversation it is. And it's not uh, only really prayer if you're on your knees or folding your hands or, or closing your eyes, right? Those can be good and helpful things. They can help guard you against maybe some distraction, but, but, but you don't need to to be doing those things in order for you to have a conversation with your Father in heaven or for that conversation to be effective. You just have to come to him. It's it's in the relationship of communing with God that you grow in him and that you see him move. And and Paul here tells us that, that one of the marks of maturity in Christ is not just that you pray and talk to God, but listen to how he describes it here. He says that, that you pray devotedly and watchfully and thankfully. So, so, so what does it mean to be devoted to prayer? Well, that word devoted actually means to continue 
earnestly. It's, it means to be steadfast. It means to be persistent and persevering. It really speaks to our habits and our priorities. Just, just think about your habits for a minute, like, like those things that you deem to be really important that you just have to do. Right? Like, like maybe in the morning before you leave the house, in order you feel like you're, you're ready right, for the day. What, what are those things for you? You've got to take a shower. Uh, you have to brush your teeth. Right? You have to do your hair or, or, or put on some makeup or a nice outfit. You have to have that cup of coffee. Right? You have to have that breakfast. We, we all have habits and priorities. And Paul is saying here that, that we ought to be in the habit of praying because prayer is a priority and prayer ought to be a priority because God is and we need him. See, see, the reality is that our prayer life, or lack thereof, often exposes our heart's priorities. It's an indication of how we see God, what we believe about him and his importance in our lives. And, and, and the more that we see him, and the more that we know him, and the more that we lean on him and depend on him, the more we treasure him, the more we will come to him in prayer. Now, this certainly doesn't mean that prayer is always easy, and that's some of what Paul's getting at here. It's also why we hear the Apostle Paul say to the church in Romans 15, he says, labor with me in prayer because prayer requires effort and persistence and perseverance. It's actually sometimes a labor. And, and Jesus teaches us this very thing in, in the parable of the persistent widow in Luke chapter 18. Maybe you're familiar with this one where there's this story about this, this woman who just keeps coming to this unjust judge again and again and again over and over with this uh, petition that she has uh, for justice. And, and, and I don't know about you, but, but, but I find that isn't it often our hurt or our need that causes us to come to God. H haven't you found in your own life that one of the big barriers to your prayer life is actually your own comfort? Just think about that. Like, do, do you tend to pray more uh, when things are good or when things are difficult? When you get bad news, you know, what's funny is you don't tend to think like, you know what, maybe I should pray about this, but I, I don't know. I mean, it's really hard to pray. No, you just like pray. You just sort of like, God help, right? God, I, I need you. God, I need your wisdom. I need your, your peace. I need your power. God, I just need you. It's amazing how difficulties in our life tend to be the thing that cause us to pray and press into God. So, so maybe like the Apostle James tells us in his book that trials and challenges actually are given and help to build us and not break us. And, and so we see this widow, she keeps coming over and again to this judge. And finally he gives in, right? Finally he says, listen, I, if I'm honest, I don't really care about your God and I don't really care about you. But because you keep bothering me, I'll give you what you ask for. And Jesus says, here, listen, if the unjust judge will do that, how much more do you think your father in heaven who loves you will answer if you persist in prayer to him? And, and this story isn't given to suggest to us that, that God is reluctant to answer prayer and, and like we have to like wear him down with our asking in order for him to do something. It's really the opposite of that. It's that, it's that God absolutely loves for us to come to him and he loves to answer prayer. Uh, this, this story is both an invitation for us to keep coming to God because he wants us to, but also for us to know that God's delays are not necessarily God's denials, that sometimes God delays are to grow us in our faith and our devotion and to accomplish his, his purposes in just the right time. In fact, Luke's gospel tells us specifically that Jesus told his disciples this story that, that they would always pray and not give up or lose heart. L let me ask you, what causes you to give up or lose heart in prayer? I know for me, it's typically when something uh, doesn't seem to happen, even though it's been a long time. Uh, like I've been waiting a long time. It just doesn't seem like anything's changing. So, sometimes it's just when the answer doesn't come quickly. and Or sometimes it's just when I get an answer I don't want, right? Maybe you can relate to that. See, God wants us to grow and mature, and he wants to teach us to be devoted. And I think that if many of us are honest, we really just want things to be easy or we don't really want to do them, right? So we don't actually know how to persist 
well. We don't really know how to endure through the struggle or, or through the waiting because when things seem to take a long and they're difficult, we just tend to give up along the way. And Jesus says to us, listen, keep coming in prayer. Don't give up or lose heart. Paul says, be devoted, church. Be earnest and persistent and persevering in prayer. Pray devotedly. But not only devotedly, Paul also tells us that, that we're to pray watchfully. Right? This, this word here means that expectantly. That, that, that means that when you talk to God, you're expecting actually that God is going to do something. You, you believe that he hears and he answers, that he loves and he cares for you, that, he, that your requests matter to him, and then he makes good on his word. If I had to guess, the Colossians needed this reminder for the same reason that we often do is because we get spiritual amnesia and we forget, right? We get sleepy spiritually. You remember that story of Jesus before going to the cross where he invites three of his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane uh, with him to pray, right? And what does he say? He says, he says to them, watch and pray. Watch and pray. That's the instruction of the disciples. And what do they do? They fall asleep, right? And so Jesus comes and he finds them sleeping. He actually wakes them up and he tells them again, hey, watch and pray. And what do they do? They fall asleep again. Right? Yeah. I think uh, oftentimes we're like Peter, James, and John, and, and, and we fall asleep. And, and rather than being prayerfully watchful, we just get sleepy. And, and here's one of the ways that you can tell you're getting spiritually sleepy, right? When you have a, a growing cynicism about the power and promises of God. This is the person who just folds their arms and says, listen, nothing's going to change. This is just going to always be the way that it is. What's the point? Because God's probably not going to do anything anyways. Or, or, or anytime they hear a story uh, from someone about God's goodness or faithfulness or work in their life in response to prayer, they're just skeptical and think, yeah, right, right? Like, like sure, that happens to you. Or they just think, hey, good for you, right? But, but nothing like that's ever going to happen for me. They doubt God's power and his promises. See, God's Promises are meant to be like floorboards in the house, right? They help to, help to keep you up and you depend on them in order for you to walk securely. But, but, but some of us, we, we take the promises of God and we more put them up like they're wallpaper. So we don't really depend upon them. They're just kind of something for us to look at, like an old photograph or something that once was or that once happened, but not anymore. And that it might be true for someone else, but not for us. Sleepy, cynical people don't often pray, or when they pray, it's, it's more of this half-hearted kind of doubtful prayer than watchful and expectant because they doubt God's promises and his power to be at work in their lives. So instead of trusting, they try and guard themselves from disappointment. This is what the Apostle James calls a double-minded person in James 1 verse 7 which is to say that they're divided in their loyalty and in their trust, so they're easily swayed by uncertainty and doubt. And at the end of the day, this isn't primarily an issue of thinking, but an issue in the heart. Pastor Tim Keller writes and says this, he says, from the heart flows our thinking, feelings, and actions. What the heart trusts, the mind justifies, the emotions desire, and the will carries out. When Paul says, pray watchfully, church, he's saying, trust the Lord, trust his promises, be expectant of him. Thirdly, Paul says to us here to pray thankfully, right? This means that we're to express gratitude in our prayer to God. It means that we remember what God's done for us and we give thanks and praise to him for it. As I already said, many of us wrestle with spiritual amnesia. We forget God's faithfulness. We forget his goodness to us throughout our lives. It's easy to fall into this kind of what have you done for me lately kind of relationship, right? Where we're just always looking ahead to the next thing without stopping to reflect and remember and, and give thanks to God for what he's done. But it's in our looking back and seeing God's faithfulness to us, that faith gets stirred up in us. I, I, I mean, just, just consider for a moment all the ways that God has loved you and cared for you and provided for you and protected you and displayed his good goodness to you just this week, just this past week. Right? And then, then consider it like, have you actually taken any time to thank him for all of that? 
See, in the Old Testament, they had this regular practice of establishing what was called an Ebenezer so that when God would do something, when God would, would move among them, they would collect these stones and they'd, they'd build up this monument uh, as a physical remembrance to remind them for all of their days of God's goodness and faithfulness. I'd say, church, that we need some Ebenezers in our day. We need those reminders of how God has moved and shown up in our lives so that when you find yourself in times of trouble and hardship, when, when God seems quiet, when you're praying and, and persisting, but nothing seems to be happening, you can look back and be reminded of all of the ways that God has been faithful to you and be encouraged, right, and stirred up in faith to keep going, to keep trusting, and to keep praising. I would say this, that, that, that if you find yourself low and miserable today, ask you, how thankful are you? How, how grateful are you right now today for who God is, for what God's done, for all the ways God has displayed himself and his goodness to you in your life? I, I'd encourage you just really to start right there, right? Start by focusing on the Lord and his goodness. Start by praising him for all of, the, all of his works, all of his ways, and, and see how that stirs your heart to pray and press into God. See, see, the challenge for us, I think, is in talking about prayer, right? And even having this conversation is that we, that, that, that we don't just respond to this by, uh, out of our guilt. We don't, we don't just kind of find ourselves and go, man, I really should be praying more. Okay, I get it. I'm going to go get, my, get a prayer journal this week, and I'm just going to be more self-disciplined, right? That, that, uh, honestly, the answer isn't to be more self-disciplined. It's to be more dependent. It's to be more needy. You don't become a praying person by trying harder. You become a praying person by realizing how absolutely helpless you really are to produce change and how absolutely sufficient and good God is. It's not more self-focus that we need. It's really more god focus. And as you pray, God works in all kinds of ways, beginning in your own heart. It's, uh, and so, so, so a question to ask is, is my life as a follower of Jesus marked by a, a prayer that is devoted and watchful and thankful? That's one of the marks of maturity, that we are a praying people. And not only for ourselves, but also for others. Look at verses 3 and 4 in Colossians. Paul writes, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that uh, we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I'm in change. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. So, so not only do we pray and bring our personal uh, requests and petitions to God, but we pray for others, right? This is called intercession. This intercession is praying on behalf of uh, others on, for their needs and, and for their good. That can be friends, that could be family, that could be co-workers, that could be neighbors, that could be anybody, right? Even, Jesus tells us, our enemies, right? E even those, that, uh, those people who are against us, Jesus, to pray for them also, that God will work in their lives for their good and their glory and his glory. Now, I think it's important here to notice too that that Paul here is not afraid to ask for prayer. And so a question for, for you might be, am I, right? Is that true for me? Are, are you willing to humble yourself and ask others to go before God on your behalf? Or are you too proud, right? Are you too scared to be that vulnerable? Or honest. See, faith is never meant to be a private individual thing. It's a communal thing. In James 5.16, he tells us, therefore, confess your sin to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. It's in our confession to others and our prayer for others that God ministers his healing and his wholeness in our lives. This means that you need to be in a place of both giving and receiving, right? Of offering your needs and requests as well as praying for the requests and needs of others. Remember here also that Paul is writing this from a prison cell, and notice what he's asking for, right? You would think that, that the ask of Paul here would be for the prison doors to be opened up, right? Wouldn't that be it, right? Like, like that's what I would ask for, isn't it? I, I, just think about this. Like, if you were in jail right now and you got your one phone call, what is it that you'd ask for? I mean, wouldn't it be like, hey, get me out of here, right? Or, or figure out some way to get me out of here? But Paul doesn't ask for the prison doors to be opened, but he asks instead for the hearts of those who are in prison with him to be open to the message of the gospel. Paul's priority is that 
others would hear the good news of the love and grace and truth of Jesus. And Paul knows that he's got this captive audience right where he is in jail. So Paul's not looking for a way out. He's asking God to make a way in. And he asks for prayer because ultimately Paul knows that it's prayer that makes the difference, that, that, that it's prayer that makes the difference not only in his life, but, but in the gospel message in behalf of others. It uh, requires the work of God for there to be any real and lasting effect. When Jesus was sending out his disciples in John chapter 20, he tells them in verse 21, he says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And then he, he does this in verse 22. It says that, and then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. See, see, before they could be released into their gospel mission, they need to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. The, the, the work of the gospel is a work of the Spirit. It's not something that you can produce on your own, in your own power. You can't change people's hearts. You, you can't open their eyes to see Jesus or their hearts to receive him. Only the Spirit can. So you need his Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit to fill your life. And you need the Spirit to speak through you to work in the lives of others. And that happens by prayer. That's what Paul's saying. Paul, Paul, Paul's saying that, look, look that like the, the, the Spirit, it's the Spirit that reveals the mystery of Christ. It's the Spirit that makes the message of the gospel clear to others. But Paul knows that, that in order for the gospel to bear fruit, that prayer has to go before the proclamation. The, the question for you then is, will you pray? right? Well, will you pray also for those who are proclaiming the gospel? Will you pray for, for missionaries and, and church planters and ministers and organizations? Will you pray for one another in, 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 as you share the gospel of Jesus, that, that God would open up a door for the message and open hearts to receive it? I, I think ultimately, if we say that we're people who want to see people come to faith in Christ, if we want to see other people set free, and transformed by the love and power of God, then we have to be a people who pray, who pray devotedly and watchfully and thankfully. But Paul continues in verses five and six. He says this, he says, be wise then in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. But Paul here now, he moves us from prayers for others to our proclamation to others, right? And notice here that our proclamation includes both our words and our deeds. It includes both our walk and our talk, right? Paul starts first with our walk in verse 5 uh, before, talk, before our talk because really most often, right, it, that it's, it's your life that it's lived that earns you the right to be heard by others. And so Paul says, listen, be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders, to those who don't yet know Jesus, which is really just to say, like, like treat people well, right? Like, be mindful of how you treat people. Like, do you treat people the way God treats people? Do you, do you reflect his nature and his character in the way that you live? Is the fruit of the gospel and the spirit evident in your life? Is there a growing love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and, and self-control? Because others will most often be a witness to your life first, right? And see the way that, that your life is being shaped by the gospel, that your life is being transformed by the gospel before they're ever going to listen to the words that you have to say. For, for you kids, right, who are getting ready to start school, right, know this, that, that, that the way that you interact with your classmates, the, the, the way that you listen to and respect and honor your teachers, the way that you re respond to bullies and stand up for others, the way that you deal with your wins and losses, your successes or failures, all of that is showing others about what God is like and about his work in your life and your heart. Jesus says it like this in Matthew 5, 16. He says, listen, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Which is to say that we are meant to, we were created to be light, right? To display the goodness of God in our schools, at our jobs, uh, in our families, to our neighbors, to anyone that God puts in our path, that they might see our good deeds and glorify God in response. In other words, the way that we love and serve and treat others is meant to help them see and praise God. 
So, so Paul says to us here, listen, be wise in how you treat others. And, and he says, make the most of every opportunity, which really means, hey, pay attention, okay? Pay attention to the opportunities that you're being given to display Jesus and don't waste them. Look for opportunities to love and to serve people like Jesus. Consider how you can help. Consider how you can meet a need or, or, or how you could just bless somebody and encourage them. Now, now, let me just say this too, as we're talking about this. Re- remember that people are not projects, okay? All right, so don't treat them like they are. We don't pre- befriend people or care about them so that we can present the gospel to them, right? We, we love them because God does. And, and, and we love them regardless of whether or not they choose to follow Jesus. And we love them not just with our works, but with our words, which is what Paul says in verse six, right? He says, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. It's just say, really, when the grace of God has taken hold of our heart, it not only changes our walk, but it changes our talk. So so that even our conversations are meant to be full of grace, regardless of how the person we're talking to is speaking to us, right? Regardless of how we're feeling in that particular moment, whether we're happy or not or whatever, right? Like, Like we are to speak to others the way God speaks to us and in a way that communicates how God sees them, what God thinks about them with his grace, Paul also says here to let your, 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 your speech be seasoned with salt. Now, what's that all about, right? Like, like, what is it that comes to your mind first, right, when you hear this, seasoned with salt, right? Uh, McDonald's french fries, right? I mean, isn't that the obvious first thing that, that comes to mind, right? Like, just l- little fried golden perfection, um, Maybe that's just me. Anyway, but, but for salt in that time, right, it was used as this preservative, right, to help keep meat from going bad. And it was also used to bring things flavor, right, to flavor some things. A chef might say that that salt brings uh, uh, the meat to life. And so when Paul says that our speech should be seasoned with salt, he's saying that we ought to choose our words carefully so that our words lift up rather than tear down, so that they produce good and not bad, that they are life-giving and encouraging, not wounding and hurtful. In in Ephesians 4.29, he says it like this. He says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Let your speech be helpful. Let it be gracious. May it be life-giving. Why? So that, Paul says, you may know how to answer everyone. Here's the implication of what he's saying, that that as you live a life that displays Jesus and as you speak words, as you speak these words that are gracious and life-giving and encouraging, that others are going to be coming to you looking for answers. So be prepared to give one, right? To tell them about Jesus, to tell them about what God has done in your life. Share his story and yours with them. Right? See, evangelism is sharing the gospel ought to look a lot more like people coming to you than you chasing after them. Uh, maybe that takes a little bit of evangelistic pressure off of you today, right? Because it's not about you trying to shoehorn and fit the gospel into a random conversations that you're having, right? It, it, it's people asking you about why you are the way that you are, why it is that you talk the way you do and live the way that you do. Remember our conversation over the past couple of weeks where we've been talking about how the gospel transforms and, and, and changes our relationships. We talked about uh, uh, the marriage relationship between husbands and wives, the, the family relationship with parents and children, our work dynamic with employers and employees. And, and, and so really what Paul's saying here is that like, like as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, transformed by the grace of God, like your marriage, the way you treat your spouse ought to look different than the way other people do. Right, the, the way that you kids obey your parents and the way you parents care for and treat your children ought to look different than the way other people do. The way that you employees work with excellence and integrity and the way you employers uh, care for and treat your employees, it ought to look different than the way that other people do. And, and as you do that, others will pay attention, right? Others will see that, and as they witness a, a life that's marked by the character and spirit of God, it causes people to become curious and ask questions, and that creates opportunities for the gospel. See, see our lives are, are, are meant to be lived in such a way that they demand a gospel explanation. Now, now, now I think another point 
that's important right here is that that he says that you know how to answer everyone, which is to say that there's going to be different people coming to you. And, and, and people are different, right? And so some cookie cutter answer isn't really enough, right? It's, it's not, that's not what he's talking about here. It, 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 the gospel is the same. Jesus is the same. But the people coming to us and our responses to them are going to be different based on who they are and, and what that conversation is like, what their need is. And so really what Paul's saying is, is that we need the Lord's wisdom to lead us as we talk to people. As, as people are coming to us, we need the wisdom of God to direct us in our speech and our conversation, which ultimately leads us right back to where we started, and that's with prayer. The invitation to us, church, from Paul is this, draw near to God, right? Press in to him. You've already been invited, right? God's already said, come. He wants to be with you. He wants to spend time with you as your father in heaven. And, and, and so he says, listen, come church, right? God's work, that, that God's work would be at work in us and through us. And so he's saying, listen, pray and pray devotedly, pray expectantly, pray watchfully, pray thankfully with thanksgiving that we might proclaim Christ ultimately with our words and our lives that others would see him and know him. That's the invitation. I want to pray for us uh, this morning and, and then we'll close with our final song and I'll leave you some questions after that. So let's pray. God, thanks for this morning. Thanks for this time. God, thanks for your word. God, I pray that you would stir our hearts, God, to draw near to you. God, that you would move in us in such a way Lord, that we would see you for who you are and respond to you, God. That we would that we would press into you, God. Lord, that you would teach us. Lord, that you would change us and transform us and make us more like you, God. That you would give us a heart to pray. God, to not just lift up before you, God, the things of our heart, God, but to lift up others. Lord, others' needs, others' requests. God, to, to lift up uh, the, the gospel work, God, that's happening all around the world. God, burden our heart for the things that burden yours. God, I pray that you would do such a work in us that with our lives and our words, God, that we would proclaim you. So Holy Spirit, move in us, have your way in us. God, we need you. Be lifted up and glorified in us, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please. 
Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he was still white as Well, hey, thank you so much for joining with us today. I really hope and pray that the Lord ministered to you, encouraged you, challenged you through his word in our time in worship. Uh, this morning, obviously, we talked about prayer and proclamation. Uh, and as we close, I want to just leave you with a, a few questions and, and also an opportunity, an idea for you um, that you can uh, think about, journal about, talk about with whoever you're gathered with today or those in your house church. Okay, three questions and then an, an opportunity. All right, first question is this. H how would you describe your prayer life? Right? Well, and, and in that then, where do you need to grow in prayer as it relates to devotion, watchfulness, and thankfulness? Here's a second question. Is intercession, right? Remember, that's praying on behalf of others, right? A regular part of your prayer life. Is asking for prayer or praying with others a struggle for you? Why or why not? So, so just talk about what that looks like. What does prayer for other people or inviting others to pray for you look like in your life? Is that a challenge for you? Why is that? Why, or why, why not? Maybe that's just something you do regularly and it comes easy to you. Share about that. Here, here's the third question. What would you say uh, that your words and actions are communicating to others about Jesus and the gospel? So like if you were just to give a, a synopsis of, of the way you speak and, and of the life that you live, what do you believe that, that, that you're communicating to others about who God is and about the gospel? And, and, and lastly, here's just an invitation. I, I'd encourage you, especially if you're with people today, take some time to pray together. And, and if you'd be so bold, Invite others to pray for you. Lay your requests before them. Lay your needs before them. And take some time to just intercede on behalf of one another. Um, God bless you all. I hope and pray that you have an incredible week. I hope to see you here next week at the Edge Church. Mm -hmm.